uh, I, I, it, it, it was a really weird pay-per-view, including getting to St. Louis and still not being a hundred percent sure what we're doing. Yeah. We're going to talk about that. I do want to circle back to the pay-per-view buys for a minute, 165,000 buys here. We're acknowledging it's not the peak. You know, you would think, well, Starcade, that's the biggest pay-per-view buy. That's your WrestleMania. Not the case. Great American bash did 200,000 buys, but just as a frame of reference, the WWF did 560,000 buys for Hogan warrior, and they considered it a flop. So they didn't try a rematch baby face versus baby face style for several years, but no more. That's not big enough. We can do better. And that was 560. Meanwhile, here, Starcade is doing 165,000 buys. Mm. Uh, we should also mention the live crowd is 6,357 paid. There's about 7,200 folks in total there. The rest are comps, of course. But the gate is under 100 grand. It's $93,425. And this auditorium holds like 10,700. But after you do all your TV blocking and things like that, there's about 8,000 seats. Starcade 1990 is the eighth annual Starcade event. It's the third one by, from WCW. Of course, uh, Crockett sold out. So 88, 89, and 90 are all under the WCW banner. Uh, this one went down on December 16th, 1990. There's 165,000 pay per view buys. That's up from Starcade 89, which only did about 130,000 buys. But it's still not as big as the Great American Bash. That show pulled in 200,000 buys. Of course, on top there, we've got Sting and Flair headlining. And I guess we technically do here, but fans just weren't as sold on the Black Scorpion. And perhaps in hindsight, just marketing a rematch with Sting and Flair at Starcade would have drawn better. It seems like a no brainer, but that was sort of a lot of things in 1990, right? Starcade not selling out in St. Louis, a wrestling town. What do you make of that? We didn't know what the fans wanted to see. Simple. No mystery, no conspiracy theory. If we had provided a card that the fans were emotionally invested in to buy, to buy a ticket, to leave home, to come park, to bring the kids or your buddies or your by yourself, whatever it may be, but leave home and, and come to uh, the arena. To watch wrestling, then they would have been there. The town had proven it decade after decade. This is not, this is a wrestling town. We did not book what the fans wanted to see. Right. Simple as that. <clears throat> and more often than not, that is the reason. Give me a reason to, to attend. And I most certainly will try to do so. We didn't do that here. Let's get to, uh, the show itself. Here we are. Starcade 1990. The readers of the wrestling observer gave this uh, thumbs up uh, to the tune of 52.8%, 39.4% thought it was a thumbs down show. Only 7.8% thought it was thumbs in the middle and Meltzer would write. It must've been a great show live because from those who were there live, the response was 31 to one thumbs up. I thought the show was good, not great or anything, but watchable and entertaining until the last match. I understand why it was bad, but it was still real bad. You watched this show for the first time in 30 freaking years. what do you think? Thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs in the middle. I'll give it a thumbs up slightly, uh, because the venue is historic and special to me. Yeah. Uh, I was so glad to get past the black scorpion uh, debacle that, uh, even 30 years later, I was happy because <laughs> the journey to get there was a pain in the ass full of drama and egos, power trips and all this shit. So I, I would give it a, uh, I would give a slight thumbs up. There are, there are portions of the show that we'll point out going through it, that if you choose to go back and watch it. Uh, as a fan that might give you some, uh, tips to uh, keep an eye on this, keep an eye on that. But, uh, I'd say slight thumbs up Conrad. I love the look of this show. The building is beautiful. Uh, we've got the ring post with the Starcade logo pads on them. It's almost like you would see in a big time HBO or Showtime boxing event. 
we've got some interesting rope color combinations and uh i love the ramp and i, I know that Cornette has been critical of the ramp from a manager perspective you can't run all the way around the ring it does sort of prevent you from doing certain things on the outside uh, but i liked the ramp what do you think of the presentation here and once and for all are you for or against the ramp <laughs> for or against the ramp what's your vote on the ramp jr we want ramp feedback I'm serious. It's one of the most hotly debated topics amongst oh, our listeners. P- I was just talking to the guy about a hairdresser. That, I'm kidding. Everybody online has a strong opinion. It feels like, and I feel like most everyone who's around my age thinks the ramp is like the coolest thing. It gives you different opportunities to do. I'll never forget seeing ramp Bobby eating. Yeah. Ramp things that whole, that whole leg drop from there and guys bouncing the ropes and running back out. Like. Cactus Jack and sting. And there were so many fun little innovative spots with the ramp and nobody uses the ramp anymore. I mean, occasionally you'll see it in AEW um, utilized, but I, I dig it. I dig the ramp. What say you? You're a ramp man. I'm a ramp I, man. I, I don't have, I don't have a problem with it. Uh, I'm not as staunch yay or nay as you are or Cornette is anti ramp. I used to like watching uh, some, uh, some of those old tapes. I think it from, uh, was from Toronto's Maple Leaf gardens. They always had a ramp uh, and it wasn't as used as frequently then uh, as it was at one in one, in one era, but I, I always thought it was kind of cool. It looked different. You know, I don't know if I'd have every arena have a ramp. I think you should have a little diversity, right. but, uh, no issues. It didn't bother me. I thought it had a kind of a classic look and being in a classic wrestling city. You know, a Mustang made a living running a, that, uh, St. Louis, uh, and the only town in his territory to speak of, he may have some spot shows here and there ran St. Joe or something like that. But he basically like Paul Bosch made his living off one town that ran regularly. You know, I don't know how often, I can't remember how often St. Louis ran, if it was a weekly or a bi-weekly or once a month or every three weeks, uh, Houston was every Friday night, uh, cause I was down there a lot. So, uh, no, the ramp was fine. Uh, and, and the building was classic. You know, the dressing rooms were small. They're kind of compartmentalized. There wasn't the big spacious dressing room. And I can only imagine how the St. Louis Hawks, uh, how they dressed because it was the, co- the confines were very small. Right. Grant, granted a basketball roster. It's not as expansive as a football roster, but nonetheless, I thought that, uh, the ramp fit the motif of the building. And we tried to sell that classic uh, venue theory, uh, a- a- as best we could for that particular event. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. So you get a notice anytime we upload some new content and go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30 year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money. It's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at savewithconrad.com.